England is home to approximately 85% of the world's chalk stream rivers. They're only found in the downs and plains within a crescent extending from Dorset through Kent and Hertfordshire to Norfolk and North Humberside, where the geological bands of porous chalk have formed water retaining aquifers. All chalk streams are rare and fragile environments. They vary in size and quality. From Hertfordshire's River Bean, flowing through the tranquil Waterford Marsh here, to those more well-known rivers associated with fly fishing, such as the Test and the Itchen in Hampshire, and the Kennet that rises in Wiltshire and flows through Berkshire. English chalk streams form a unique and irreplaceable part of our national landscape and heritage. Chalk streams are rarer than giant pandas, they are our rainforests, our most endangered habitats. The water flowing in a chalk stream is normally crystal clear. This is because rainwater, which is slightly acid, is purified as it percolates through the chalk strata to emerge from springs in the valley floor. The water that emerges is very alkaline and hard with a relatively constant temperature of about 10 degrees Celsius. Chalk streams provide a pristine environment for wildlife and their unique ecology is excellent for producing the best fly fishing conditions because invertebrates and wild salmonid species thrive in their alkaline waters. These transparent cool waters are also ideal for the cultivation of watercress. Hertfordshire we're very fortunate in that we have some beautiful chalk river systems and I don't know why every chalk river in the UK is not a triple SI site of special scientific interest. They are as important to us as our tropical rainforest to the rest of the world. They're incredibly biodiverse, they have very high levels of species diversity and we take water from them, we drain them till they're dry and we, we trash the habitats and it, it is absolute uh, national scandal that happens in something that's such a precious resource. Okay. So we identify usually using a microscope and a key. This is a, a, a Nemurid stonefly. Um, we have a, a range here. I have uh, stoneflies and caddis in this sample. So for instance, um, our stonefly here, very distinctive, the two tails, a very distinctive body shape. The caddis also distinctive. We have both case caddis here. Um, this is a, a little larvae outside of its case. And here's a free-living caddis, Plechonemia conspersa. It's quite large, it's free-living, it's predatory. Um, it will go climbing over the stones and it will eat any of the stoneflies as well. They're an important part of the food chain in every, any river system because uh, caddis in particular are often referred to as fish food. Now the river bean and its lower reaches actually does flow and it it's, has a range of habitats. Uh, the sorts of habitats we'd be looking at which would support these groups of organisms are um, gravel beds, which are classic for chalk streams, with some macrophytes. Uh, we have um, classic macrophytes you'd expect to have in a chalk river, like water crowfoot, the ranunculus, calytrichae, the water starwort. We also have things like raw ripper. Um, we have um, watercress. They're, they're all very traditional plants you'd expect to find in a, in, a, in a chalk stream, chalk river. The upper reaches of the river bean are of real concern at the moment because it's been drying out. There's been water abstracted for, for potable use for drinking water and it's meant that the whole of the chalk stream uh, in the northern part of the, the river, the northern stretch, has, has dried out and this is a disaster in ecological terms because the upper reaches are usually the sources of any any water quality and any insects that are going to colonise the lower reaches.
The Bean rises near Rushton, northeast of Stevenage town, and flows through the rural villages of Walken, Aston, Wharton at Stone, Stapleford and Waterford to join the River Lee at the county town of Hartford. The River Lee in turn flows on into the River Thames. During the past five decades, the River Bean, a once famous fishing river, has been heavily over-abstracted, leaving much of its upper reaches as little more than a dried up ditch for most of the year. The primary cause of this sorry state is because in 1950, three boreholes were sunk 340 feet into the chalk aquifer below the River Bean at Whitehall, a short distance upriver from Watton at Stone. By 1955, a government licence was in operation to pump up, or abstract, on average 5 million gallons of water daily. That's the equivalent of about 10 Olympic swimming pools. The abstracted water is pumped to a reservoir at Pin Green in Stevenage, which also has a water tower to ensure supply to the higher areas of the town. This initiative was planned to coincide with the enlargement of Stevenage, which commenced in 1952 and was envisaged as a new town of 60,000 people. But that estimate has grown considerably to a current population of about 84,000 and with future planned expansion up to 100,000. Of course, we all need water to drink, wash and flush the toilet. But Hertfordshire has one of the highest consumptions in the UK, averaging 180 litres per day per household, which looks like this. Of this pure chalk stream water, 20% is flushed straight down the loo. Our target is to reduce this to 120 litres a day. Even this level is not sustainable, and without urgent corrective action, the fate of this once beautiful chalk stream will continue to spiral into a terminal decline. This is what the River Bean should look like. Until the 1940s, the Bean was a famous trout fishing river. A fact that was recorded in the Mercury newspaper back in 1842. In the Hartford Museum's archive, there are many intriguing historical references to the River Bean and particularly its many village water mills. The oldest, like Seal Mill and Walken Mill, were in existence before the Norman Conquest and appear in the Doomsday Book. For centuries, water-powered mills were used to grind corn and produce meal for making bread, which was a staple food. Although only a short-lived venture, the first paper-making in England was on the River Bean around the end of the 15th century. The museum also holds personal diaries and recorded oral histories covering childhood memories from the 1920s and 30s. Among these are the recollections of Greta Saunders and her account of her parents' riverside tea gardens at Waterford. On Sundays it was a magnet for cycle clubs and families who came by train to Hartford North Station and walked a mile and a half to Waterford Village. They liked to swim in the river and play games on the marsh before enjoying a watercress tea that was served on tables with starched white tablecloths placed close to the river. Apparently Greta's father used to gather the watercress each week from the river bean and store it in a bath. Peter, would you like to tell us more about the wildlife that you have here? Yes, there's a there is a vast amount of wildlife uh, and it's very apparent first thing in the morning. Dozens of different water birds. Uh, we have deer passing through the garden. Uh, the odd fox, not always welcome, but uh, he has his job to do. So uh, we do enjoy a, a, a terrific uh, amount of wildlife on a daily basis and it's a great joy to see them. You mentioned kingfisher, you have one regularly? Yes, um, guaranteed to see the kingfisher every day. Uh, he follows the course of the river. You've got to be pretty quick to see him. He goes at terrific speed, but you get that lovely uh, colour uh, flash by. It's a, it, it's a wonderful sight. And do you have water voles? The water voles have not been so apparent lately. I, I, I'm quite worried about them, but um, there is evidence they're still around, but I haven't actually had a sighting for some time now. Well, we noticed you got a mink raft. 
Uh, yes. Do you think mink are around? Is that the problem? The, there are mink around. Uh, the other side of the railway, down towards Hartford, uh, they they have actually uh, m had to dispose of some mink that appeared. And I have uh, one of the things when the school children come, we give them a a, a chart of foot uh, footprints that they can follow. And uh, the last time they came, there were definitely mink footprints on the raft we had. We often used to take the horses in the summer and especially in the spring when the fresh grass was about that the horses could get laminitis. And so we used to take the horses down to the, the river, which is just before the Mill Bridge River where the mill stream is and we used to call that the paddling river and we used to go into the river and stand there in our Wellington boots and hold the horses while their ho hooves got nice and cool in the river because it helped them. When, when we were playing down at Moor Bridge we used to watch for the trout and we used to bomb them with stones. It was a big, deep pool in those days before the um, barricade further down, which made a waterfall, um, was taken away. And after that, the river ran freely. And uh, that is the reason why it is not half as deep as it used to be. But. Um, we never used to swim down there because it was always considered about 14 foot deep or more and dangerous. We used to wait until the river was frozen. In those days there would have been about two and a half um, feet of water and it was in the direction directly behind us about two, three hundred yards down and we used to take our cycles onto the ice and sticks and try and play ice hockey uh, with a putt that we'd cut out of an old piece of wood and uh, that's how we used to play the game. I think my daughter uh, expressed that when she wrote to me and she said Dad, the river was a, stri was a stream which you could enjoy you could play in, it was clean, it was always flowing, it was constant. Now she called it a ditch. Well, as you can see, we don't regard it as a ditch because we try to keep it going, but it, the flow is so slow uh, and it varies it's because it's fed from uh, Stevenage Brook rather than from uh, the, 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 the source at Cromer. Uh, it, it obviously, uh, the water that we're getting down here is insufficient to do the job that it originally did. And of course, we've got the floodplain here as well over, as you will see, which is, well, it, it's, now we, ha we hadn't had a, the, the floodplain has never been wet for years and years and years. When we first came here, every winter, uh, the water would come up onto the floodplain. But it's been it's very sad that it's, it's been, uh, the NRA as it was then, uh, decided to deepen the river the channel by about a metre uh, and that in, in many respects killed uh, our part of the river. The problems began in 1955 where this large pumping station here at Whitehall beside the River Bean was built to supply water to Stevenage. Due to the large volume of water abstracted daily the river now dries up in the summer and indeed, when we had a period of drought that ended early in 2012, the river was dry in the winter as well. Back in 1991, a group of environmentally concerned local residents got together and formed the River Bean Restoration Association. Their objective was to try to find out why the river was drying up so that they could restore its water flow and its wildlife. But during the intervening years it became apparent this can only be achieved by the total closure of water abstraction at the Whitehall pumping station. The association has persevered with its campaign for over 20 years and experienced at first hand a saga of changing political agendas administered by a bureaucracy best described as disconnected or mismatched. 
The responsibility lies with several public and private bodies, DEFRA, Offwat, Affinity Water and Thames Water, whose objectives sometimes conflict. In 2009, Oliver Heald MP, North East Hertfordshire, sponsored an early day motion titled The Condition of Rivers in England that was debated in Westminster Hall where he raised the dire state of our English chalk streams and rivers. Charles Walker, MP for Broxbourne, in a more recent adjournment debate, also stressed these concerns. Similar views have been expressed by the Environment Agency and the World Wildlife Fund to our regional water company. But the prime concern of the official regulator Ofwat is to keep water bills as low as possible. They regard expense for sustainability improvements as generally outside this remit. My farm is in the higher level environmental scheme and a great deal of effort goes into protecting the river. Uh, we have these wide margins between the crop and the river which prevent spray and fertiliser and also soil erosion from getting into the water. The farm above us, Walken Hall Farms, are in the higher level scheme and so is the farm below us, Woodhall Park. So pretty much the whole length of the river is protected. So it's extremely frustrating because there's no water in the river. We are at borehole number five, which is about halfway down the river. And I'll now demonstrate a borehole dipping. Have to lift the lid on the manhole cover. And the Environment Agency have given us a dipping kit, which has a sensor on the end of a tape measure. And when it hits the water, a buzzer sounds and a light goes off. So we let it down slowly so it doesn't run away with you and take ages to wind up again. And there we are, it's in the water now. So we wind it back to there. And then you measure from the top of the borehole, which is four meters 90. And then wind it back up again. And we've been doing this for the last 17 years, every month. So we have quite a large data set. Uh, which lets us know what's going on. And then remember to tighten it off again afterwards or it escapes and goes around the car. Lid back on and write it down so you don't forget. The monthly borehole data gathered by our BRA members is passed to the Environment Agency to assist their understanding of the fluctuating groundwater levels. Um, here at this site on the Lammas at Wattonet Stone, um, the river, although it looks reasonably pleasant, it, it could actually be a lot better. Um, just downstream from the spot where I'm standing is a weir, and weirs um, cause a number of problems for rivers. Um, firstly, they're a barrier for fish movement, so fish get isolated either above or below a weir, and then populations can't mix. Um, they also back up the river, so Ideally, we want to see a nice, fast-flowing, clear channel with a nice gravel bed. But because this river is backed up behind the weir, you can see it's quite deep, it's quite ponded, and the base of the river is quite silty as well. So that really is quite bad news for invertebrates and for fish and for lots of the other animals that, that should ideally be, be living in this river. This stretch of river has also um, previously been straightened and it's been dredged and it's been widened as well. Um, Ideally, rivers should meander um, across their floodplain. They should have nice curves, they should have lots of variety in the flow. But this really isn't the case because of that previous straightening and dredging. So we're really trying to do something about that by adding a bit more variety to the flow. And how we do that is add what we call flow deflectors, which are basically tree trunks which we secure at an angle in the river. And that forces the water around and kind of makes the river meander around really instead of just being a very straight uniform channel. Well Hearts and Middlesex Wildlife Trust fully support the campaign to reduce abstraction on the River Bean and um, that's probably the biggest threat facing the river. Um, and education is really key, it's vital that people understand the link between the water that they use and the water in their, their local river. So we've been working with the RBRA to raise awareness, working with schools and with the general public to try and um, educate them about that and really raise awareness of the issue.
Through the Warden scheme involves uh, a group of people, each responsible for a stretch of the river, which they walk once a month and file a report of their observations on the state of the river. The things that we're particularly concerned about uh, is the control of invasive species and the things that we're looking out for are things like uh, mink and signal crayfish, uh, Himalayan balsam and giant hogweed. The plants are a particular problem because they affect the uh, other plants, the indigenous plants growing around them and they also uh, affect the uh, structure of the uh, river banks and the riverbed. Giant hogweed seeds um, are thought to be able to survive uh, upwards of uh, 20 years in the soil before they germinate. So we could be looking at this problem for a good many years. Uh, we pull the whole plant up and first thing we do is to break the roots off and throw them above the flood line and then we break the stem and twist the stop, so t twist the top uh, of the plant off where the flowers are and that will then prevent any water being taken up the stem by the flowers allowing continued flower development and then we just pile the remnants on the top of the bank and it will decay and disappear. We're at the offices of Affinity Water in Hatfield to interview Mike Pocock, the Physical Assets Manager, and discuss their five-year water resources management plan for 2015 to 2020. The plan proposes a 90% reduction in abstraction at the Whitehall pumping station from an average of 18 megalitres a day to just 2 megalitres per day from 2018. Our approach to water resource planning has changed, there's no doubt, this time around. Partly because of our long working relationship with groups like, like the River Bean River Restoration Society. We've been very well aware um, that there's been a strong groundswell of opinion that we should reduce abstraction in the rivers. We did try and uh, persuade uh, our regulators that we should do more at our last plan, but we weren't successful in convincing them that there's a good cost-benefit case. This time, we're much more confident that we can now move forward. As a company, we have a strong community focus, and we're really keen to do our bit to support the local ecology and our local communities. We're planning to reduce average abstraction by 90% of the river bean, that's about just over 18 megalitres a day. That's obviously a large proportion of the reductions in the bean. Um, we see this as very significant. It's obviously a, quite a large quantity of water that would be supplied otherwise to steamage and we have to replace that water by demand management measures and by bringing water from elsewhere. Um, but it clearly will make quite a significant difference to the, to the river ecology by, by leaving, uh, taking that amount of water uh, or, or from supply and leaving it in the environment. There is a pumping station up on the uh, top end of the River Bean, uh, which I believe is called Whitehall. There are proposals from the water company to um, actually cut the amount they abstract by 90%, but that wouldn't even be contemplated for another five years. Um, that's all very well and good because we'll have 90% more water, um, which is left in the river rather than being taken out. As to recovery, there are problems with this. It's not going to be an instant. Just because you've got the water there doesn't mean you're going to have everything occurring the following year. It will take at least five, maybe as much as eight years to actually get to a, a diversity and a list of species that you'd expect to see in a chalk river, something that would be comparable to the River Mimram. There's no doubt that the part of our solution to be able to reduce does retain some of the pig use and that's partly because we're trying to um, minimise the cost of bill, water bill payers on, on achieving a solution to the reduction of abstraction. By, uh, and we, we can, we're doing that by carrying out metering elsewhere, water efficiency with customers. We're also bringing in water from elsewhere because we can't make all the demand savings in Stevenage. So we know that there's, with an engineering solution, we will have a permanent solution to uh, much of the uh, water reduction to, that would otherwise have gone to Stevenage. And that means we will have a reliable long-term solution. But 
where we are able to save money with uh, on, on customers' bills is if we can retain um, emergency use of that source, we don't have to put in two pipelines. We can achieve this by putting one pipeline in, um, and that means that should there be an emergency situation arise, uh, we can use the source. But it would be a short duration. And the one thing I can be very clear about is um, the conditions of use will be strictly controlled. That's something we recognise is important. The environment agency believe it's important, and we're very happy with that. So it means the conditions like pollution or uh, failure of, a, of a, a pipeline, for example, will be specific conditions to allow that use. So um, I, I do think the, uh, it's very, very unlikely we'll, we'll see a creep up. Once the rules are set and we've agreed them all, everybody's clear, we will comply with them. Since filming the interview with Mike Pocock at Affinity Water, the regulator Ofwat has given formal approval to Affinity's Water Resources Management Plan, which will be achieved without increasing local water charges. Also, the Environment Agency have publicly announced their intention to reduce the licence abstraction at the Whitehall pumping station in two phases, an interim reduction by 2015 and a full 90% reduction by the 1st of April 2018. This is wonderful news. The river should flow properly again within five years. And if we can do all the work necessary to restore the river, it could be restored, hopefully, to its former glory in under 10 years. The RBRA will be working with both Affinity Water and the Environment Agency to monitor the river beans recovery. We're at Watnett Stone Primary and Nursery School to join a brainstorming session by Year 5 pupils on how best to conserve water in the Stevenage area. <laughs> But if you have a shower, you won't waste as much water because you just have like t two minutes in the shower and it's washing all water. But if you go in the bath, it'll take like a long time just to fill the uh, bath because the bath is really high up, the bath is really deep, so it'll fill loads of water and you're wasting loads of water. My dad said you need a gallon in five minutes. A gallon in five minutes? Gosh, that's quite a lot. Is it Abigail? Um, in your garden, you could have a water duct because that collects like the rainwater, and you can use that to um, wash your car or, instead of like, water your plants instead of using the hose. We're here outside the House of Commons to record an interview with our local MPs Oliver Heald and Stephen McPartland. Oliver Heald has been quite active on our behalf for a number of years and in 2009 actually hosted a debate in Parliament about rivers, the condition of rivers in England. And in that debate actually he thanked some of us for our contribution to, for his research. Stephen McPartland is the MP for Stevenage. He was elected in 2010 for the first time. 
and he's been very supportive as well and last year he came on our Walk the Bean event and helped us get quite a bit of publicity. It was shortly after I was elected for that part of Hertfordshire, uh, which includes the River Bean, which was about 1997. Um, and Ian Knight, who's a member of your association, he came to see me at my surgery in Watnut Stone and started explaining to me about all the measurements that were being taken and the worry about the river. Well, I was really pleased that so many uh, people from the local village came out to support us. That was the main thing for me. And the real impact we had with the media that was present walking along the dry riverbed and the fact that we were able to show them that when it rained heavily, you know, it would be maybe five or six feet deep and actually show them with the reeds on the side where it would run. It was a big eye-opener for them and I think that was what encouraged um, the village itself to get even further behind the project and the media started to pay a lot more attention but for me back in 2007 when I first met you and Ian Knight we um, walked along and did some of the measurements with the boreholes and that's when I first started to realise there was a major problem and you guys explained to me that there used to be salmon in the actual river uh, and trout it was a big um, fishing river and you know at the time when I was walking along it it was a completely dry riverbed what had happened was that Ian had gradually shown me the measurements were getting worse and so we got to a really dry summer, I think it was about 2006-07 that time, um, and it, it was so dry that you couldn't see any water in the river north of Watnut Stone. And so um, I think it was at that point that I, I think a lot of us became worried in Parliament about the chalk streams, you know, precious resource. Um, and so I, I, I did initiate a, a motion, first of all, uh, an early day motion, which got 125 colleagues signing it, just saying how concerned we all were about the chalk streams. And then we subsequently held a debate uh, where colleagues were able to come and put their, their views. I think when we um, launched the charts, one of the biggest impacts for me was myself and some of the other MPs who were present, is we stood in the River Bean and our feet didn't get wet. And, uh, you know, that was a big issue for us. You know, we were standing in the River Bean, there was like this trickle going past and it actually rained previously for about three, four days and it just wasn't wet at all. It was a real challenge. I think in terms of planets, I think one of the things we should try and do is have the water authorities linked in as a statutory body when it comes to planning agreements at the moment it seems to be that people say well you know we're going to build 25,000 more houses can you provide the water and they say well yes we can but the problem is the water would come from rivers so the river being would be completely dry and even more rivers would get drier and drier so I think we need to look at how you build in a sustainable way. One of the things that I've been doing is pressing all the various authorities so the environment agency the water company off what you know, really going after all the various players in the hope that you know, this will lead to, to a change, and I, I believe it is doing. Well, I think the Ruby and Restoration Association has done a fantastic job. I mean, you know, you said yourself, my colleague Oliver Heald has been a massive champion of the River Bean and chalk streams across the whole of the UK. Um, he's held debates in Parliament, done early day motions, so it's really been raised to the highest level. He had previous ministers here who have got promises that the new minister will come along. So I think River Bean Restoration Association has done a huge job, and it can do more. I mean, if you remember, Dave, we actually managed to hold a summit whereby we brought together all the relevant agencies and stood on the river being myself and you included and we said you know what are we going to do about this and we do have the plans in place for them to stop the abstraction at the Whitehall pumping station which would solve our problem. Our dedicated campaigners can transfer their endeavours to overcome the years of neglect the river Bean has suffered. If you are interested in joining us in helping to restore one of Hertfordshire's iconic chalk streams. A worthy task. Join us at the River Bean Restoration Association. On the banks of the Bean, George and I, we go walking the crystal clear water. It makes our hearts sing where the swallows swoop low. George runs to and fro, scaring pheasant and partridge away. Kingfishers and otters at play. But it's a dream, for the river is gone. From Old Hall to Cromer, 
we can't hear its song And that walk in the mill It stands very still As it grieves for the old river beam On the banks of the beam George and I we go walking, sunlight on the water, insects on the wing. As I cast my line out to a basking brown trout, a heron looks on in disdain. As I hopefully cast out again. But it's a dream, for the river is gone From Walken to Aston, we can't hear its song And at Whitehall we cry, for they're pumping it dry Yes, they're draining the old river beam On the banks of the beam, George and I, we go walking Past broken old willows, collapsed in despair No swallows swoop low, as George runs to and fro No pheasant or partridge to scare the wildlife, it just isn't there But we still dream, though the river is gone From Whitehall to Watton, we can't hear its song Then at Hartford we see, where it joins with the Lee all that's left of the old river beam And the best we can tell Of what say, go to hell Because it's cheap, you can weep for your dream Say farewell to the old river beam